Chapter 6, Nagababa, the Monsoon, and Katmandu, at last. The profundity of this enlightenment implosion, swallowing the universe in a cup of Tibetan tea, mm -hmm. deeply unsettles me. I get, prof I get like restless, extraordinarily. Mm. My gut feeling is mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, uh, time to move on. My inner adventure. Yeah. At Chitre Monastery, I evolved 10 years in three juicy months. I mean, if my film were being edited for a documentary movie, there would not be one frame to edit out. Not, not a single one. You know what? I'm starting to see this like Tibetan monastery scene as Copycat consciousness, Buddha wore burgundy, so all the monks wear burgundy, Buddha cut his hair, so shh, <laughs> you know, everybody cuts their hair. Um, I identify more with the unconventional, solitary searching yogi, like Milarepa or Varupa the author of the profound three visions, 11th century core book, you know, for Buddhist monks. I just read it over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, Earthy? I'm thinking the same thing. Time to come down from the mountain hmm? and assume my place in the mundane world as a spiritual innovator. Wow. Newborn sense of freedom. Spiritual release. I become achingly homesick for my cave scene in Greece. I meditate with Earthy. What about that? Homesickness for the Ganesha cave. She agrees. So um, let's split <laughs> this scene here, okay? And um, make a run for it all the way to Rhodos. Yeah, oops, oh, that makes me realize I'm going to have to score a new, fresh American passport in Kathmandu. Okay. Yeah. Well, so before dawn, I get my Zadu clothes back on and fold up my Tibetan robes, leave it on my straw mattress with a note thanking the Tibetans for my uh, instruction, food, shelter, loving kindness, and that I'm headed for Kathmandu, about 300 kilometers, 185 miles to the west. You know, I'm going to Kathmandu specifically for sure because I don't want to go back the other way to Mani Banjang, Sukhipokra, Darjeeling. I'm afraid I would get the monastery in trouble for sheltering a foreigner who has no passport and so on. So I'm off to the other direction. Dorothy, bye-bye. She's my only friend savvy to my premeditated leaving the monastery. I don't speak with anyone else about that. My first steps away from the monastery, zzz, 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 it feels like I'm stepping on an electrical shock grid. Strange. Um, I'm afraid. 
Yeah, I'm afraid inside. No money, no passport or identification. No companion in this unknown land. Earthy, where should we start out? Where should we go first? We head for the hut of Nagababa. Hmm. And after a day's walk, Nagababa is delighted, <laughs> but not surprised to see me. That night, Nagababa spellbinds me with stories from his life when he was a mendicant watering, wandering Zadi, carrying half kilo chunks of pure hashish. He roamed all the way from Burma to Afghanistan, no passport in those days, especially for yogis. Uh, he talks about checking out the University of Benares, world famous for centuries, and that disappointed him. He didn't stick around there. He went up to the sort of famous guru cave scene in Rishikesh where the Ganges comes crashing out of the Himalayas. Such a holy area, Rishikesh. And the temples north of there, Kedarnath. And, mm. uh, and those yogis and gurus disappointed him also. Finally, Nagababa rejected it all, and solitary-seeking yogi. Mm -hmm. He tells me stories about Mahatma Gandhi, his beloved guru, buried beneath him under his leopard skin. He tells me when he was uh, searching for soma mushrooms on Mount Everest, he he didn't know, but apparently he was on the Chinese side of Mount Everest. The Chinese arrested him and imprisoned him for three days. <laughs> they went through all his hair, <laughs> you know, that goes all the way to the ground, looking for secret electronic spying <laughs> devices. He refused all food in prison. He just threw it back out, <laughs> you know. They let him go after three days. Nagababa, he, he honors me for, you know, walking away from the protected, isolated monastery scene, striking out on my own. We hang out together for the next four days. He uh, shows me off to his farmers, <laughs> friends, and uh, to honor my visit, they drop off some huge stalks of marijuana, <laughs> which grows like weeds over here in the Himalayas. Uh, yeah, he's very revered to these mountain Nepali farmers who plow the terraced landscape with water buffalo. Mm -hmm. Nagababa doesn't smoke anymore at all, cannabis or hashish. Myself, I haven't smoked since Darjeeling three months ago, and this this <laughs> mountain marijuana is so strong, and I'm not used to it anymore. It makes me nauseous, and I have to go outside and vomit in the tall grass. Nagababa is so kind. He comes out and attends to me until my stomach is completely empty. Mm -hmm. Well, at dawn, Nagababa and I go to the creek and take our morning bath. He says, like, don't dry off. You'll, you'll, you'll reduce your prana level, your energy level. He just stands naked and lets the mountain wind wick him off dry. Mm -hmm. We harmonize so well. Yeah. I can contemplate living with this guru. I mean, the Tibetan trip blew my mind. And now I have this once-in-a-lifetime golden opportunity to hang out with a, an authentic yogi. 
who speaks sophisticated British English, you know, real Hindu mystic. After the fourth day, Nagavava goes off somewhere, no word of farewell, and while he's gone, I grind chilies with his mortar and pestle, make crude, <laughs> Whoa. really uh, malformed chapatis, you know, from his stock of wheat flour, meditate with goddess earth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Reflect about getting sucked into the source, into the engine room of the universe. Well, uh, by this time, three days have gone by. No Naga Baba. Hmm. Monsoon's coming. Yeah, I gotta go. I either gotta stay or go. Mm. I slip my bamboo flute into my Indian shoulder bag and attempt to outpace the summer monsoon. What's that, Earthy? Oh, okay. Uh, Earthy wants everyone to know that this is where he, she uh, stopped her channeling, her direct challenge, channeling, <laughs> channeling of the story with the phrase, attempting to outpace the summer monsoon. Her channeling's over. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from this f f uh, phase onward, I, <laughs> Earthman, wrote the rest of the book to be to be absolutely precise I wrote chapter 2 Celestial Calling Go to India the rest of uh, the book from now on Okay. I dust myself off on the millennium old footpath above Nagababa's hut undaunted I visualize my goal, Kathmandu, 300 kilometers, 185 miles to the west. Oh, I feel assured. Oh, yeah, it's very reassuring to be trekking on a familiar path. Because this is the way I hitchhike with the pack horses to bring the apple trees to the monastery. Now I'm just retracing my steps back to Elam. Uh, in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So for the next two days, I walk happy-go-lucky through the mountains. My stomach is full from the chapatis of Nagababa's flower, wheat flower. Pristine nature. <laughs> Panoramas in the Himalayas. Stunning sights to behold and I feel deeply liberated to be on the road again after sitting with the Tibetans look at I don't have any kind of pack nothing okay I'm free to play my flute while I walk these gorgeous endless footpaths Wow, back in Elam. Pay my respects to my Peace Corps friend, Peter. He laughs when he witnesses my bedraggled appearance. Wholeheartedly welcomes me inside. Awed by my plan to what? Try to walk to Kathmandu now? Risk the monsoon, the merciless downpour? Risky, he reckons. Because Peter explains to me, when these torrential rains do finally arrive, many of these small swing rope bridges across rivers get washed out. And where whatever valley you happen to be in at that time, you got to live there until fall. No way to get in or out. 
Peter. Nello, guardian patron saint, offers me dinner, lodging, hashish. So I say, two nights, you know, I'm going to rest up, gather my strength for the 300 kilometer walk ahead. Peter's so kind. He puts an aerogram into his typewriter and invites me to compose a letter uh, to a loved one. He says, look, uh, we'll, we'll put it in the diplomatic pouch <laughs> with the Peace Corps mail. And, uh, so I, I write a letter to my beloved John, my co-conspirator, going all the way back to Boston when I had the mystical experience. So uh, chance to signal John from the Himalayas? Well, okay. This is what I wrote. June 4, 1969, Elam, Far Eastern Nepal. Dear John, good morning. I flunked the monastery. I quit there and being a monk on May 26. After a week in the jungle with the Zadu, I have walked to Elam, now generally drifting toward Kathmandu. So you can write me, just post Earthman, uh, post Restant, General Post Office, Kathmandu, to arrive the first week of July. Yeah. This intersection should occur according to the structures of hallucination. My circumstances, John, no money, no passport, scrap of bread, no passport, yippee, <laughs> yeah, uh, health, fair, malnourished, facing the monsoon, but why, uh, well, because the rhythm of my soul <sighs> has finally recognized itself. Good morning, trans political self. Distinction, John. My conscious is not international, rather, it resides in a transnational dimension. I'm talking freedom, love, abundant food and water for all the earth people. I believe, John, that a finer dimension for the relationship of earth, mankind, and the universe is actualizable. Myself, I am becoming a well-toned earth person as a gift in unique ways to the world, which I will describe to you in later notes. John, I give you the guts of my freedom. Love, Earthman. Mm -hmm. Well, before my departure, Peter uh, gives me a couple of rupees to get me through the next four days' walk to Dunkuda, where there's another Peace Corps volunteer. He's got a friend there, huh? Mm -hmm. And during these walks, I just uh, approach the last house, Nepali farmer and talk to them in simple English. And there's not much to understand. You know, you can make like sleep, hear, food, no, don't want, you know, and a few Nepali words. And uh, they're so kind, you know. And sometimes they invite me inside. Uh, the houses have fires, real live burning fires in the middle of the living room, which are vented out to a small hole in the ceiling. And, yeah, sometimes they say, yeah, come on in for a chai. Sometimes, no, they, whatever, you know, thank you. 
thank you. Yeah. Oh. Well, eventually I walk from one Peace Corps volunteer to another. <laughs> Halfway to Kathmandu. Hmm. Takes about two weeks to get halfway there. Um, Okaldunga, halfway point. Mm -hmm. Big regional center for the mountain folks. Um, and that's where I join up with a couple of Peace Corps guys and about three Nepalis, their friends. Uh, they're hiking to Kathmandu and they invite me to just like join their party. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. Lucky. Um, so I don't need my sketch map anymore. I just follow these seasoned mountain trackers. The views. I just can't get over the views. Magnificent ridge line. Calmly look around. Feeling proud of myself. Mm-hmm. For my cosmic explorations, just you know, major Earth trek. <laughs> oh, I guess this is what it's like to be a young man. <laughs> well, look, crossing the highest passes, mm -hmm. I must struggle to keep pace. With these season checking companions. And our robust party finally meets, reaches the outskirts of Kathmandu in just five days. These guys blaze the trail. About 30 kilometers a day, 150 kilometers, five days. A trip of a lifetime. How fortunate. 